So thanks, everyone, for coming. This talk is going to be about Apache Kafka and the next 700 stream processing systems. I don't know if it'll be 700 exactly, but hopefully around that. Uh, my name is Jay. Um, I, this is an area I've been working in for roughly the last five years. Um, I'm one of the original authors of Kafka. Um, and so now I'll try and condense everything I know about this area into you know, 35 minutes. Um, so the, na the name comes from this uh, old 1960s uh, computer programming paper on a, a system called iSwim. Um, and what I liked about this paper was it tried to break down this language into kind of constituent parts and see how you could recombine those parts to get different things. And so um, that's a lot of what we've tried to do with Kafka. And I'll try and explain in this talk some of the parts that make up Kafka and um, how they can get recombined for stream processing. But before I do that, um, I should probably mention you know, what stream processing is. How many people have heard the, the phrase? Probably some, most, everybody? OK, so everybody already knows. You, you, you can actually skip this section of the talk then. So my, my definition of stream processing um, is going to be a little different. I happen to think this is one of the most exciting things going on in technology right now. Um, I'm a little biased because I'm, I'm working in the area, but, um, but I think it's really exciting. You know, w the way I think of it is there's, there's really three paradigms for computer programming. Um, of course, there's lots of ways to, to slice up computer programming by different types of programming languages or whatever. But one that I think is actually a pretty good way to slice up the pie is by how you get your input and how you produce your output. So you know, the, the systems that most of us probably work on are request response systems. So you get a request, you give a response. People are probably also familiar with batch computation. Um, and stream processing is actually kind of a third thing. And, and so I'll talk about each of these real briefly. So you know, request response, this is you know, uh, HTTP, a REST service, um, pretty much most of the things people make. Um, you know, somebody sends you a request, which is really kind of one chunk of data, one input, and you send back one output, one response. Um, and uh, of course, there's lots of these requests. And, and this is really the way you know, most systems are built, at least the interactive part of it. And usually, this is synchronous. Like when I send you my request, I'm actually waiting for the response. But, but still, the back end of most large companies is actually big batch processes that kind of turn over um, maybe once a day, sometimes only once a week. And these are a little different, right? They, they take all the inputs, and they kind of crunch on them, and they produce all the outputs all at once. Um, and I, I like this picture. I don't know what the guy is doing. I think he's just like listening to see if his Hadoop job is done yet. Um, <laughs> and she's just like, it never finishes when you're listening like that. Um, so you know, it's, kinda, it's actually kind of surprising that we still have all this batch stuff around. Um, but it's not that surprising. Like probably most people's first computer program was a batch program, right? It was some little Unix program that read in a file and munged it and spit something out. At least mine was. And um, there's actually some advantages to this type of computation. It tends to be really efficient, uh, or at least it can be, because you're allowed to kind of pre-organize all the data in the, the order you want, and you get really good data locality. So often, batch computation is really efficient. In fact, if you ever want to do something really scary, take all the kind of input requests for some kind of service-oriented architecture and kind of try and rewrite your logic just as a batch, like Python script or something. And, and process them all in batch, you'll actually find that that script runs about 1,000 times faster than your big service-oriented architecture, most likely. Right? Why? Because you can kind of pre-organize all the data into the right spot so if, if you do it that way. Um, and this is why this stuff still exists. And between these two, request response and batch, that's pretty much everything. Um, but there is an alternative, which I, I think is you know, getting more popular and is out there, which is stream processing. And this has kind of been at the periphery. There are certain systems that work this way. Uh, but it's kind of just now starting to become mainstream. And the difference uh, in stream processing as opposed to these other two is instead of getting one input and producing one output, or instead of getting all the inputs and producing all the outputs, now the program actually kind of has the control. So the program kind of gets some inputs, and then it produces some outputs. And how much is some? Well, that's up to the program. So it, you know, it could, for every input, produce an output. And it could take all the inputs and then produce a bunch of outputs. But it can also do everything in between. So, so it's a kind of a generalization of these two extremes. Um, and what's exciting about this 
is like a request response, like client server program. It, it runs forever. Um, but, but it also gives you kind of total control over the trade off between latency and efficiency. Um, and it allows you to do a lot of the kind of complicated analytical things you might have in these big kind of batch jobs, but it allows you to do them really quick. And um, you know, what, what, what it doesn't mean, what I just gave is my definition. A lot of people will have a different definition in mind. And, and what it doesn't mean is um, computation, which is you know, transient or approximate or lossy. And a lot of systems that have done stream processing have been that way. Um, you know, so so the, for a while, you would see stream processing systems, and kind of the way they worked is you would throw data at them, and they would try and compute something, and they might get the wrong answer. And if you know, things came too fast, maybe everything would fall on the floor. Um, but there's nothing inherent about that. That was just a weakness of those systems. So, so I, I don't mean anything that's transient, approximate, or lossy. You can absolutely make stream processing you know, get the exact right answer, as you would expect with a batch process. Um, and it can compute you know, the full set of things that are computable. The domain of stream processing usually is asynchronous stuff. Like I said, it kind of generalizes this full scope from request response to um, batch processing. But it's kind of more useful for things that are asynchronous. By asynchronous, I mean decoupled. Um, and this, this kind of decoupled work is actually really useful. Right? This is where you know, uh, all the kind of back end intelligence of a lot of companies happen. And in general, I found when building systems, whatever you can kind of take out of the synchronous part of a request, where maybe you have just a few milliseconds to get your job done, and put into something asynchronous is usually the better. It's usually more efficient. It's usually safer when it fails, because it doesn't take everything else with it. And um, you know, a lot of people may have seen um, some of these kind of stream processing program things. This is some reactive X snippet I took off the web. Um, and so you'll see a lot of these types of APIs designed around stream processing and you know, getting that done. But what I'm really talking about is not so much this. This, this is you know, like the kind of um, Rx Java or these other things. These are really libraries for doing computation in one process. And, and they present really a user interface to processing a stream of data. And that's very useful. But what I actually am more interested in is kind of stream processing in the large. And I think this is kind of a trend you'll see in a lot of places. The scope um, that computer programmers are interested in has kind of um, expanded. So, so a lot of systems now are no longer focused on just the internals of a, of a program, kind of where you know, a programming language would be. They're actually kind of zoomed out, and they're, they're focused on um, computer programming at the data center level. So a good example of that would be something like Mesos. I don't know if people are familiar with Mesos. But what it does is kind of simple, right? It starts and stops processes. But by doing that kind of across a company, you can actually get quite a lot out of it. Um, and the same way, I'm actually interested in stream processing in this way. So you know, being able to represent what's happening inside of a company as a set of streams. And it turns out I think this is a pretty good metaphor for you know, what a company or organization or large data system does, right? It has streams of inputs um, that represent all the kind of new things coming into the company. It has a set of processes that run, that respond to those inputs. It has some state about you know, what it currently knows. And then it has outputs. Um, hopefully, one of those outputs is money, but not always, right? Um, so if you think about something like, like retail, um, I think everybody's familiar with retail stores. You have sales. You could represent kind of a stream of continuous sales in a big retail um, you know, uh, company is going to have a continuous stream of sales in different locations, probably all around the world, probably continuously. You have a stream of shipments. You have a stream of maybe price adjustments and inventory adjustments. You have analytics and fraud, and you need to reorder products. Um, and you can actually map this pretty well to streams and stream processing. So sales and shipments are maybe new inputs. These price adjustment processes and inventory adjustment processes, analytic processes, are probably stream processors that react to this and do something. Now, they may not be implemented that way. They may be implemented as kind of weird services or batch, probably most likely in, in real stores, batch processes. But they, they could be implemented as kind of real-time things. It would be much faster. And it's actually kind of a better metaphor for what's happening. But um, the kind of problem, and the, re the reason you haven't seen as much stream processing stuff to date is really um, th there hasn't been the infrastructure for it. So you know, the world of kind of request response things that's up there at the top, this is your kind of OLTP databases, you know, REST frameworks. It's actually pretty well developed. 
And you know, it targets you know, getting a response usually in a few milliseconds. There's pretty good infrastructure there. And if you come down to the bottom, um, you know, kind of batch stuff, you've got Hadoop, you've got data warehouse stuff like Teradata. It's actually quite advanced. It's really pretty good. Um, and so there's a lot of supporting infrastructure if you want to do processing there. But in the middle, there just hasn't been that much to help people out. Right? And so if you want to build anything which is kind of slower than a few milliseconds but faster than a few hours, um, you kind of are on your own. You're kind of inventing it a little bit from scratch. There has been stuff here. So there's kind of your enterprise messaging systems, uh, complex event processing, or CEP. There's kind of a thing called an enterprise service bus that hopefully not that many people have heard of. Um, the OLTP world has had database triggers and materialized views, which are their attempt at kind of asynchronous, you know, responding to events. Uh, but none of these are really good. None of these are really technologies you would want to develop a large, meaty piece of, you know, important uh, company uh, infrastructure on top of. And, you know, the result has been uh, the, the work that's done in this domain tends to get pushed upwards into the kind of request response layer or downwards into the kind of batch systems, and there's kind of a vacuum in the middle. And that's really kind of what we've been trying to address. And the reason there hasn't been, the reason there hasn't been much here is really there's a, there's a number of hard problems that a stream processing system has to address. Um, you know, the first is, since I said I was talking about doing this in the large, is partitioning and scalability. How do you spread a program over many machines and be able to elastically add you know, capacity to that or, or shrink it down? And how do you spread the data as well? Um, semantics and fault tolerance. What does it mean when one of these machines fails? Uh, what do you do? Um, there's this whole problem of unifying streams of data with tables of data. So in the retail example, there were certain things that were really tables, like what's our stock on hand? And there's certain things which are clearly streams, like the sales that are occurring. And how do you put those two things together gracefully? Finally, time. Time is kind of the worst thing in computer programming in general, as anyone who's tried to deal with dates knows. Uh, but it's particularly bad in distributed systems, where um, there isn't <laughs> the, the notions of time become many. And stream processing suffers from this even more. In the request response world, you basically ignore time. So if you have a microservice architecture, you query lots of services. They're all kind of at now. What does now mean? I don't know. But you know, it's roughly now, right? <laughs> uh, in the batch world, they actually just control time by loading all the data at the beginning of the day and then uh, not changing anything until the end of the day when they do the load again, right? So um, stream processing is going to have a much harder time because it has to continuously you know, account for change. But it may actually need to catch up with older data. And finally, reprocessing. So let's say I have a stream processing system, and I maybe count things that are occurring. If I change the logic in my program, I'm going to want to re rerun that program and, and get new answers again. So um, OK, so that, that was kind of an introduction to the area. The, um, now comes the, the Apache Kafka part. So Apache Kafka is a system um, I built with uh, some of my coworkers when we were all at LinkedIn. And we since left, and we started a company, which is kind of in this area. Um, but what it is, is is really a kind of messaging system or you know, stream database or something. So you have lots of producer processes that publish streams of messages into Kafka. Kafka is a distributed system. It runs on a bunch of computers. It kind of maintains all of these streams of data. It maintains them in a fault-tolerant way so that you know, each piece of data is stored on multiple machines and it can handle failures and all that. And then it allows consumers to tap into those streams and consume them. And, um, that's kind of the, you know, what does it do? How it does it is actually really different from typical messaging systems or other systems in this space. Um, so internally, what Kafka you know, stores is a log. And um, not everybody has seen this idea of a log. It's actually a very simple idea. These little rectangles here are meant to represent you know, messages or records. Um, and um, each record, I've kind of given a number, like 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And the next writes are always appended at the end. And different readers could, could be reading. They always read from left to right. And so you could think of this as being kind of like a formalization of the log files you get out of your applications, so like an Apache log, right? Um, but this is a little bit crisper. So the contents, they may not be plain text. It may actually be some binary data. I don't know what the contents of one of these records are. I've given each line a formal number. And I'm, I'm actually allowing readers to kind of subscribe to it. So you could think of it more like a commit log in a database. 
but, but it's not very different from an from a Apache log. And it turns out that this data structure is very closely related to the problem of uh, you know, consensus or having you know, many distributed things agree on an answer. Um, so most people would you know, use a log as the implementation of something like Raft or multi-paxa. So these types of algorithms are really kind of maintaining a log. That's probably the, the simplest way to think about what they do. And they show up in databases. So you know, inside of a distributed database, um, you will often find some type of log of changes. It's the core set of what data was modified. And um, not all databases make the log part explicit, but certain many of them do. So I, I know um, one of the big distributed databases at Yahoo does this. The, the database at LinkedIn where, where I was did this and actually is, is now starting to use Kafka for that distributed commit log. I know the big database at Twitter does this. So it's, it's not uncommon to have an explicit log system that is recording these changes. And since this is a talk about stream processing, I would argue that this type of log is actually the kind of physical manifestation of a stream. So I talked about streams of data. What does that mean? Well, I think formally defined, it's going to be a sequence of records. And the only difference I would add is you know, you're probably going to partition this up into multiple logs, so you have some notion of parallelism. right? If everything is totally ordered, then you, everybody has to coordinate um, to, you know, to, to maintain that order. And since many things happen in parallel in a large company, you're going to have many of these kind of partitioned logs. And so producers are going to add messages. Consumers are going to read them. Um, and, and this is kind of the core data structure that Kafka maintains. So if you understand this data structure, then you basically understand everything there is to know about Kafka. Um, it just maintains logs. It tries to do it at large scale efficiently, not lose data, you know, handle faults, all the kind of hard stuff. And so now we know what a stream is. Stream processing, you know, in my worldview, is really just uh, transforming some of these input logs into output logs. Right? We said log was basically like a stream. So the processor is going to be your, your code in some sense. And there can be a framework which you run your code in, which helps, you know, helps make it easier to write the program. But it could also just be like a, you know, a Python program. Uh, there's no magic. If you're transforming one stream into another stream, you're doing stream processing, and you can, you can pat yourself on the back. Um, one thing I've, I've kind of called out here is there's like a little database looking thing, a little orange database looking thing inside the block of your code. And that is state. That, that are, you know, stream processing, the easy problem is if you give me one input and I just give you an output, then, then it's not very hard. But if I have to maintain some kind of state that is, you know, a count or a join or something that's going to span some length of time, it could be, you know, uh, you know, the whole execution of the job, or it could just be, you know, counts over a five-minute window, then I'm going to have this state with my job, and I have to make sure that that state is kind of protected, even if my code, you know, dies. And that, that's going to be one of the hard problems. Okay. So, you know, an important thing to understand in this area is the concept of a change log. So I talked about logs, and I talked about streams. But one of the, the core uses, especially in data systems, is maintaining a log of changes. So here, I've kind of drawn out a series of put operations, so mutations, right, updates, um, to key. So it's put key value. And you have a, a bunch of you know, modifications of the same small set of keys. And you can use this to represent the notion of change over time. So the progression of the log from left to right, that's basically time. And these put operations that are recorded in the log, this is the set of changes which represent the mutation in the state of the database. So anybody who is interested in functional programming and knows about kind of persistent data structures, this is the exact same thing, but applied to data systems at a larger scale. And this, it turns out, is actually you know, very commonly how databases do replication. So like Oracle has you know, kind of a log shipping protocol, and MySQL has a log shipping protocol. And internally distributed databases do this. And you can replicate state off of this. And this is going to come into play in stream processing as well. So Kafka happens to have a particular facility for maintaining this type of mutations to state, which is we call log compaction, um, which allows you to take these type of redundant updates and compact them down by getting rid of the redundant ones over time. And this is important because it's going to turn into a way of maintaining that type of persistent state that I just talked about. OK, so we've gone through most of the ingredients that Kafka offers. We've gone through logs, partitioned up, fault tolerance in those logs. The final thing that we have to talk about is how to you know, actually scale the stuff outside of Kafka, the, the consumers of data. 
So it's not enough to be able to horizontally scale the data in Kafka. You have to be able to scale the processing of the data. Otherwise, um, there's really no point. And the facility that Kafka has for this is called groups. So it allows many processes to all kind of join a group and know who are in that group. And so originally, we did this with Zookeeper. But in the, in the newest release, it'll actually be a kind of native facility of Kafka. And what this allows this group of consumers to do is actually divide up all the logs and each kind of process its own subset of logs. And, and it does this dynamically, so you can kind of add new consumers, and they'll join a group, and they'll start doing work. And if one, some of them die, they then you know, come out of the group, and you know, their work is given to other people. And this is maintained dynamically. And there's multiple groups, because Kafka allows multiple readers for the same stream. So all these streams are multi-reader. So those are kind of the ingredients that Kafka provides. Um, how do those actually come together and attack some of these hard problems in stream processing? Well, I'm going to give you know, a quick outline of, of some of the ways that this happens. Uh, the actual mechanisms for doing stream processing with Kafka, the most popular one is kind of just in your code, I guess. People you know, consume data and do stuff. Um, but there's a bunch of frameworks which have emerged which kind of help with this. So there's uh, Spark has a kind of Spark streaming, which will do stream processing and works well with Kafka. Storm is a framework which works well with Kafka. Samza is a framework which we wrote, which uh, is actually you know, built to work natively with Kafka. There's another system, Flink. Um, and they all use you know, different set, subsets of these facilities I've described. Um, and the thing I'm going to focus on most is actually new work that will just be coming out in the next month, uh, which is called Kafka Streams. And what it is is actually not a whole framework or distributed cluster you deploy your code into. It's actually just a library for stream processing. But it does the same set of things that most of these systems do. So it'll, it'll kind of address these harder problems that I've talked about. OK, so the first hard problem was partitioning and scalability. In Kafka, this is done by basically dividing up these logs and with this group, group management feature. So, so this is really the way you know, Kafka streams or these other stream processing systems can divide up the work, hor you know, horizontally spread it over a set of processes, and change the processes. What makes this hard is the fact that these processes are allowed to maintain state. So if you were here for the last talk, I think it was on stateful services. In some sense, each stream processor is its own stateful service, and it has to solve those problems of you know, what happens when I come up somewhere else and I don't have my state, how do I get it back? Um, and the way we do this in Kafka is using that change log feature. So uh, Kafka allows you to maintain change logs, like logs of updates. So one of these processors, which is keeping local state, it can keep local state in like a RocksDB instance or local key value store. It can keep it in memory. It can actually keep it however it wants. It journals out these changes to Kafka, and that acts as a kind of fault-tolerant backup of everything that's happening. It, it, the new you know, instance of that processor can always restore off that if it needs to. And this allows Kafka to, to represent both the notion of a stream, which I've drawn on the left, and the notion of a table, which I've drawn on the right. And putting these two things together is actually really important, because what people want to do with streams of data is usually join them on to existing tables of data, which usually comes in the form of change logs. And so unifying this notion of a log of changes with an instantiation of those changes, like a key value store, is one of the key things I think that these um, stream processing systems have to address. OK, fault tolerance. So there, there's actually a bunch of aspects of, of this, and it's probably too much to get into in a talk like this. But Kafka helps to do this by detecting failures via that group mechanism. It allows you to restore your kind of state off these change logs. And since the data streams themselves are replayable, whatever hasn't quite been processed yet can be pulled back. Um, there's more work to do here in Kafka. Like there, there's actually a prototype of a more complete kind of atomic transaction across rights and so on that will strengthen this. But, but a lot of these systems that, that do stream processing basically rely on that replay mechanism to be able to get, provide their guarantees. All right, the final hard, hard problem here was uh, time. Um, and this is one that in our earlier days we didn't fully understand. But it turns out that you really need to be able to deal with late arriving data. And so you really have to be able to do counts and joins. And all of these have to be updatable when new data arrives. And so it turns out that really the solution to that time problem comes out of maintaining counts as sort of mutable tables that can keep being updated even after that time has kind of passed on the local clock. OK. So those were kind of some of the, the hard problems. 
it turns out if you solve these problems, you actually do kind of achieve this unification of batch processing and stream processing. And the way you do that is pretty easy. So if you have this like log abstraction, you know, a batch process is one which kind of wakes up. It has some position in the log. Maybe it's at you know, time three here. It processes forward until it's time you know, it reaches the end. Then it goes back to sleep. Maybe it wakes up again at the end of the next day, and it processes more. Uh, and then it goes back to sleep, and it wakes up again. Um, so batch processing is actually really simple. It's just, you know, it's just a process which, when it reaches the end, it shuts itself down. And it kind of happens on some schedule. Stream processing is one that kind of stays alive and keeps waiting for new changes to arrive. And so this log concept kind of helps you unify batch processing, um, which happens on some kind of regular schedule, with stream processing, which happens continuously as data arrives. And, and that kind of brings us to this reprocessing problem. What do you do when you change your code and you need to recompute things? It's actually really simple. You just go back to the beginning of time and reprocess. And the beginning of time, it may not be everything that has happened, because you may have compacted that log down to just the kind of most recent updates. And so th this notion of time is in Kafka is called the offset. That's your position in the log. And zero is kind of their very beginning. So you know, anytime you change your code, you can kind of reprocess in this stream processing system by just rewinding to the beginning and letting it rerun. And this can happen in parallel, because these, these topics are actually multi-subscriber. OK. So how does this actually play out in the large? We, we started to put this stuff into practice, and we kind of called the idea a stream data platform. So up at the top here, I have those kind of request response systems. These are applications or REST services, database. And you can kind of capture changes out of these into Kafka and have the kind of set of streams of what's happening in the company. You can attach to this uh, stream processors, which do transformation on those streams. So they're, they're responding to updates that are happening in databases. They're responding to log events or things that might be happening in applications. And they take those streams and they, they kind of transform them into new streams and publish them back. And then usually feeding off of them in this kind of asynchronous domain is real-time analytics, alerting, a lot of the kind of intelligence you know, stuff that's happening quickly. So that top layer is really the kind of request response area. The middle layer is your kind of asynchronous uh, stream processing area. And finally, you can feed these same streams into Hadoop or a data warehouse. And so we, we actually spent a lot of time you know, building this system and, and getting it to scale. And then we actually put a lot of this into practice at LinkedIn and then through open source, actually, in a lot of companies. So Kafka is in thousands of companies now. Um, and at LinkedIn, it was actually, I think, as of you know, a few weeks ago, is actually taking about 1.1 trillion uh, messages or records uh, per day that flow through this kind of central message broken or persisted. And that, that's the feed of all the data into the offline world. It's the basis for all the kind of stream processing and real-time analytics or nearline stuff. Um, and it's also um, you know, kind of like one of the core uh, you know, data systems for storage and other data systems that rely on this as a kind of commit log. And so if you're interested in these ideas, um, Kafka is an open source project. It's an Apache project. You can read about it there. Um, we have a pretty active blog about Kafka and stream processing stuff at, at Confluent. Um, that Kafka streams work I talked about, there, there's actually a design document. If you Google KIP28, you'll read all about it. And I have stickers if you want them. And I think we're pretty much out of time. So if you, if you have any questions uh, or you want a sticker, um, just come find me. I'll be around. I'm the really tall guy. Thanks so much. <laughs>